RCC. And we are in the thick of the Christmas season. And so this morning, as we enter into worship, can we lift up worship carols of praise today? Songs of Christmas. We have a Savior, and He is here. We celebrate your presence, Lord. Yeah. We sing joy to the world. The Lord is come. Let earth receive.
this sufficient grace is available to all who would make him Lord of their lives. And it was all won on the cross of Calvary. This victory was won for you and for me. And so we worship you, King Jesus. Let's grasp the fullness of your grace.
Christmas. You can tell that it's Christmas time by the amount of red flannels that you see. So I didn't get the memo this morning. I apologize, but next week I'll wear one. 
Uh, my name is Tyler. I'm uh, on staff here at MRCC, and I just have to give a couple of announcements this morning. The first one being tomorrow is our monthly Sisters of Strength gathering at 6.30 p.m. here in the sanctuary. All ladies are welcome. It's just a time of fellowship. Uh, and then also there's a meal. I totally got it wrong last time, so I didn't even ask what we're eating uh, tomorrow. Uh, you'll just have to come and enjoy it. I got to take a deep breath. I'm so sorry. Okay. I was like holding my breath, and it was, it was bad. Uh, next Sunday is our kids' Christmas program. Uh, you will want to be here early uh, to enjoy it because from the first row to the 10th row is filled with grandparents. Uh, so make sure you get here early during all three gatherings. Uh, we're excited for that. Coming up on December 19th is our ugly Christmas sweater Sunday. We always like to give out little prizes and whatnot. And also we get to see what some people consider to be ugly while others consider it to be normal. So it's always a great Sunday. And then coming up on Christmas Eve, uh, our 3, 4, and 5 p.m. Christmas Eve gatherings. It's going to be 3 p.m. online if you decide to join us uh, online that day. Uh, if you could open up your Bible to 1 Corinthians, we're also going to be in uh, John this morning. He's a weird little critter. He is, uh, Tyler. And, uh, thank you, Tyler, for sharing with us. Thank you for the announcements. Uh, I'm always tempted to say when he's out of breath, well, you got to loosen up that bun in back, but I'm not going to say that in public. Uh, I'm not going to say that about it. Because that wouldn't be cool if I said that. It's great to see you. It's great to be with you. Welcome to Second Service here at MRCC, and Merry Christmas, you know. Uh, especially to all of you who are joining us online in the live stream as well. We're thrilled that you're with us. Merry Christmas to you. We get to, we get to say those words with a depth of meaning that most of the world doesn't. You know, I, I grew up unchurched, and so as a young man, I, I didn't know what Christmas was about. I did, you know, I thought it was Santa and some reindeers, holiday specials, trees, blah, blah, blah. And when I became a believer and understood that it was about God becoming one of us. God, in all his grandeur, becoming a baby in a manger just to reach us. Man, that blew my mind, and my mind hasn't recovered, in case you're wondering. Uh, read a marvelous little book I'd recommend to you by Max Lucado called God Came Near. It just talks about that reality. But anyway, Merry Christmas to you. I, I want to ask you, if you would, please, before we open God's Word together, before we have a little something special to do, I want to ask you to pray with me, if you would. Um, we are, the Bible says, a royal priesthood, a kingdom of priests, and that means we intercede on the behalf of others. That's part of our role, and, and our, our, our land desperately needs that. Our world needs that. So would you pray with me? Would you bow your heads? Father, we come to you this morning thanking you as we just sang for who you are. Lord, that you would reveal yourself to be a God who becomes a baby just to draw near to us, just so that we would draw near to you. God, we worship you for that. We thank you for that. We rejoice in who you are. And we come to you, Lord, because our, our land needs healing, both in body and in soul, Lord. And you are our healer. We cry out for all those who are sick. We pray for those who are afraid of being sick. God, we pray for the sickness that is in the body and the sickness that is in the soul, Lord. We ask for healing, Jesus. We pray that you would stretch out your grace, your powerful grace, that leads us to repentance and that you would heal our land. And God, may we, your people, be an example of what it means to do things your way. We pray for that. Lord, we ask as we open your word together that you would speak to each one of us, that you would help us hear you. You are that small voice in our hearts. Give us ears to hear, we pray this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before we open the word this morning, though, we have something special to do. I'm going to invite TJ and Ashley to come up front, and they're going to bring little Birdie with them. What a great name. Uh, little Birdie is coming to be dedicated this morning like her brother and her sister were before her. Go ahead and step right on around here. Do you want to pick her up so everybody can see her there, Ash? Is that cool? And uh, TJ, the man of the house, the priest of the home. I think Birdie fits. Does Birdie fit? Yeah, it absolutely fits. And this morning, 
We come together because TJ and Ashley have asked to come and, and dedicate their daughter just as they dedicated all their children to the Lord. And whenever we do baby dedication, remember we think of three things. We think of, first of all, the Bible tells us that children aren't accidents that land in our lives due to biology. God places them there. Uh, Hannah prayed to be a mom. God gave her a son, Samuel. And because she knew that he came from the Lord, she brought him to be dedicated at the temple. And that's what we're doing. That's what TJ and Ashley are doing this morning with Birdie. And then second, we recognize that uh, each of those children uh, are placed into our lives, to, to, but they really belong to the Father. They really belong to God. And so the dedication is a recognition that they belong to him. You know what, friends? It's entirely possible that we're looking at the next governor of the state of Washington sitting right there. <laughs> so, hey, that's possible, right? That'd be great. That would be great, TJ says. So, yeah. <laughs> but there's a reality. In all seriousness, there's a reality. She has a calling. And TJ and Ashley are coming today to dedicate her to that calling, that she belongs to the Lord, that she belongs to the Lord. And then we come as well to give thanks and to say, God, um, we receive the gift that you place in our home and to dedicate themselves to raising her to know the truth about who God is, to know Jesus as her Savior. TJ and Ashley are doing that today as well. And, and that's a commitment, friends, that doesn't just, you and I aren't just spectators in that. Because the truth of the matter is that she's going to grow up learning about who God is from, from her church, from us, from kids' church, from the conversations in the foyer in the parking lot, from you and me. And so this is a dedication not only that TJ and Ashley make of themselves to Bertie, not only of Bertie to the Lord, but all of us to support this family as they seek to raise her in the things of God. So this involves you and me. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to step over here on the other side, and I'm going to lay my hand on Bertie, and Dad's going to come over and lay his hand because as the Bible teaches, he is the priest of his home. And her brother and sister are going to lay their hands. There we go. Good job. Oh, too many hands. All right. We all know the feeling, right? Let's pray together. Father God, we come to you this morning giving thanks, Lord, for the gift of Bertie placed in this home by your sovereign hand. And God, we are grateful for that gift. We recognize that she's not just a, an accident of biology, God, but she was knit together in her mother's womb by your hand, that every hair on her head is numbered, and we give you thanks for placing her here. Lord, we, we dedicate her alongside TJ and Ashley. We dedicate her to the calling that you have for her life. God, we pray that you would work out your purposes perfectly in her heart, in her mind, in her life. We pray your protection and we pray your fulfillment and satisfaction as she seeks your ways. And then, Lord, we stand beside and behind TJ and Ashley as they dedicate themselves to raise her to know who you are. God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would fill their home, that her life would be filled with learning about you from her mom and dad. We stand beside them as they dedicate themselves to her and her to you. And God, we thank you for moments like this. May we as a church never forget that the children come first in your heart. We pray your blessing on Bertie in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Great job, you guys. Yeah. Too much touching going on. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Amen. Amen. You know, I was reflecting this morning in the foyer that I was talking to uh, one of our students here at the church who's 13 and that I dedicated 13 years ago. I'm getting old, man. It's happening right in front of us. Hard to believe how much time flies. Grab your Bible, if you would, please, friends, and open it to John's Gospel, chapter 4. Um, and I want to encourage you to, to be in the habit of bringing your Bible with you when you come to church, opening it when we open God, whether that's on your phone or your iPad or, you know, an old-fashioned book, whatever it is. But God will meet you as you open his word as an individual, as well as we do that as a congregation. He'll meet you in the middle of that. So John, chapter 4 this morning. And, and, and what we're going to do today is just a little bit different than normal. In fact, I'm going to do something today that I haven't done in 15 years as our pastor. And that'll be kind of towards the end of our message. But towards the beginning, I, I want to ask you this. Who are the people who helped you to become a believer? Who, who are the people who helped introduce you to Jesus? 
who helped you know God as your father. Maybe those are family members, parents or grandparents or co-workers or maybe somebody in your school. Who are those people in your life? And I say people because inevitably there's more than one. Uh, inevitably there are several who play different roles. That's exactly what the Bible teaches us. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But who are your people, the ones who helped you become a believer? And then let me remind you as you think about them that there are a lot of people you don't know about who helped you become a believer. There are a lot of people who played roles behind the scenes. Everyone has people who help them open their hearts to God. Some we know of and some we don't yet know about. Jesus said that, that becoming a Christ follower is like being born all over again. It's like a, a, a rebirth from the inside out. And being born involves more than just one moment and more than just one person. I was thinking about that this morning and I came across a few slides of moms talking about the realities of pregnancy because, you know, sometimes we think that a baby coming into the world is just about one moment. It's not. It's about nine long months, ladies. Say amen. I came across a couple slides I thought I'd share with you. For example, this one, how I see myself introducing my baby. I made this. I thought that was kind of cute. I asked my pregnant wife how she feels, and she texted me this. Yep, yep. I asked my husband to put the Oreos somewhere I can reach, and so he did, you know, on the floor. Get pregnant, they said. You'll glow, they said. And not always like that. Sometimes during labor, the pain is so great that a woman can almost imagine how a man feels when he has the flu. It's, it's almost, it's just... Just about there. Pregnancy, as all pregnant women know, redefines a great night's sleep. <laughs> Makes a whole different animal. And then there's when you get out of the shower and sit on the bed trying to get motivated to get dressed. The reality of, uh, uh, of pregnancy. Yeah, it's a journey. It's a process. It involves more than a moment. It involves a long process. And, and a process that God loves because pregnancies produce, friends, hear me now, his favorite thing in all the universe, a human being. Sometimes we get deceived into thinking there are other things he loves more, but there aren't. Pregnancies result in the greatest thing in all the universe that God loves and delights in, and that's a human being. And he loves that process of pregnancy and he loves the process of, of spiritual pregnancy, whereby a human being becomes not just a person, but a son or daughter of God. Like physical birth, that's a reality that involves more than one person. That's a reality that takes time, that occurs over time. And God wants to talk to us about that this morning, because it involves more than a moment, and it always involves a team. I, I asked you, who are the people who helped you become a believer? Now, now let me ask the follow-up question. Who are you helping to become a believer? When you think of those people who help you, you're filled with gratitude and thanksgiving. Who are the people you're helping? You see, the Bible teaches that God uses a team of people to help other people come to know him. The Apostle Paul wrote about it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He said, what after all is Apollos and what is Paul? He says that because they were tempting to elevate spiritual leaders into celebrities. God says you should never do that. They're just people. He says, they're only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. And he kind of builds this picture. He says, I planted a seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. And so the man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his labor, for we are God's fellow workers. In other words, this process that God loves so dearly of people being born again, of people getting to know God as their Father, Jesus as their Savior. It's a process that involves a team, a team that will be profoundly rewarded, a team that gets to call themselves God's fellow workers. And that's what the Lord wants to talk to us about a little bit 
as we turn the corner into Christmas. Christmas is really the story of God seeking and saving people, of God starting the process of what we might call spiritual pregnancy, whereby people are born again and become believers. And the reality is, as Paul laid out in 1 Corinthians 3, we each have a part to play in God's great mission to seek and to save people who are far from him. We're not the stars of the show. We're not ultimately responsible for the results, as we're going to see in a moment. But we earn our Father's reward when we receive his call to be his fellow workers. This morning, I want to invite you to turn to John chapter 4, if you haven't already. Let's watch Jesus. And we want to do two things this morning. One is... We want to feel his heart, where he's coming from, the heartbeat of God, if you will. We want to feel that. And then second, we want to hear his call to be part of the team that pursues his passion, the saving of lost people. John chapter 4, beginning with verse 4. Here's what the Bible tells us. Now he, Jesus had to go through Samaria. He's, he's got his daily business like we all do. He's got his, his agenda he's carrying out. And part of that was to pass through a place called Samaria. And Samaria is the other side of the tracks. Samaria is a rough part of Israel. Samaria is filled with people far from God, people whose lifestyles are out of bounds. He's in that place. And the scripture says he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, Near the plot of ground, Jacob had given to his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. That's the setup. That's the point. What's about to happen is going to happen at the main village well. Tired as he was from the journey, Jesus sat down by the well, and it was about the sixth hour, noon, in our reckoning. And let me call your attention to the fact that that Jesus doesn't have a plan or an agenda for this moment. He's going about his business. He's doing what he does. He's passing from one place to another, just like you and I do day in and day out. Go to work, go to school, take care of things around the house, the neighborhood, the supermarket. He's going about his business in that way. That's important to understand because sometimes we think that our part to play in this team mission is to generate the results on our own. Our part to play is to be available to be ourselves and to be used by God in that process. That's what happens to Jesus. Tired as he was from the journey, he sits down by the well at noontime. Friends, evangelism, this process of people becoming sons and daughters of God, it is the work of God. It is his ministry. We are merely tools in that process. We need to understand this deeply. It's not up to us alone to make it happen. Listen to what Paul says again. I planted the seed... Apollos watered it, God made it grow. Jesus was emphatic about this repeatedly. For example, he said over in John chapter 6, verses 44 and 45, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. No one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. In other words, God's mission to save people has more to do with his seeking us than our seeking him. And Jesus wants us to know and understand that. Sometimes we make ourselves so uptight about this. Jesus is just going about his everyday business, and in the middle of it, God uses him. What this means is that there is no sense in which you and me make it happen. Only God does. Only God can, and it depends on him, which also means that you and I don't have to be specially qualified to be used. In fact, Jesus was tired in this moment. He's exhausted. He's feeling like we sometimes feel at the holidays, just worn out, and we don't want one more thing, but here it comes. And you don't have to be good enough. Like Paul says over in 2 Corinthians 5, we don't sing and dance. We don't put on a show. We don't develop a program. We just be ourselves. And God uses that in the middle of our everyday business. This is really important to grasp. When I was learning to drive as a teenager, it seemed like a huge and overwhelming challenge, like I'm sure it did for you. It's a big vehicle. It goes fast. Now you drive with one foot and one finger while you're talking on the phone and eating at the same time. Because you've learned some things about how it happens. And in the same way, God wants us to grasp that he's the one seeking people. And we just play a part in that process. The idea is that God is the real seeker. You know, I'm in a strange phase of parenting now. My son is in his 20s. 
And uh, I discern when we get together over and over and over again that, that he's kind of motivated and driven to, to feel like he's doing things that will earn my love. You know, that he's doing things that would earn my appreciation. You know, the way he's handling his finances, the way he's handling his work life, and so on and so forth. When we get together, I can see him straining to feel like he's... From where I'm sitting, he's already got my love. <laughs> he's got it in spades. He couldn't possibly have it more. And yet I see him struggling. So Sometimes we're like that with evangelism. We think it's about how hard we try when the reality is. It's about God using us in the middle of our everyday business. Jesus is going about his business, and the scripture says, verses 7 and 8, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, he said to her, will you give me a drink? This is ordinary stuff. This is everyday stuff. It's noontime, the hottest part of the day, the middle part of the day. Very few people would be at the well normally. In fact, there's only two in this moment. and She has something with which to draw water, and so Jesus says, hey, can I have a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food, the Bible tells us, and in that little tiny moment, God begins to use him in her life. This ordinary moment turns into a connection, into a dialogue, and it turns into a dialogue about hurts and hang-ups, about who's right and who's wrong in the culture, about prejudice and race and gender and religion, but Jesus because he genuinely loves her and because he has owned his identity as God's fellow worker, is going to take this opportunity to talk about much more important things. So he says to her, will you give me a drink? She says, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. She says, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. You're a man, I'm a woman. There's a culture war, don't you know that? You can't cross these boundaries. Jesus says there's something infinitely more important. He says to her, here's the reality. Apart from all that stuff, God has a gift to give you. God has a gift he wants to give you here and now in this moment. Jesus is saying that to her. The Holy Spirit is still saying that. He's saying that to you and me in this moment. He's seeking to say it to everyone on the planet. God has a gift to give you. It's more important than your hurts and hang-ups. It's infinitely more significant than all the conflict you think is the center of life. He said, no, here's the truth. God has a gift to give. Do you believe that? Jesus says that's the reality. And when he looks at all the Samaritan women in our world, people on the wrong side of the tracks, people whose lifestyles are out of bounds, you know what's on his heart? I have a gift for you. I have something I want to give you. It's free, and I'm here to offer it to you. Moments like that change everything. This woman's noontime routine at the well is about to be profoundly changed. But again, let me call attention to the fact that Jesus is just going about his business. He asks for a drink. The woman responds, and then he offers to give her this gift. Moments like that change everything. I remember when I was a youth pastor, and um, had a group of teenagers down in central Mexico, way out in a rural area. We are doing a missions trip, and the place where we were had no power, uh, no hot water, barely had running water. And so when we came home at the end of every long day, we came home to a pitch black compound uh, with a cold shower and a hard bed. And, and it was important work, so we were willing to do it. But when we would get back to the dirt parking lot at the end of the day, there was a little bit of a hill we'd had to climb with a bunch of uh, scrub trees on it. And then you would step out of those trees onto a plateau, and that's where our, our dormitory was, where we were staying in. About the third night, we got home, and we're climbing up that hill. Everybody's dead tired. I'm, all I'm thinking about is my head hitting the sack when we get into the dormitory. It's pitch black. And we get to the top of that hill... And one of the young people, one of the teenagers, Daryl, he puts his hand on my arm and he says, Pastor Greg. And I thought, okay, what does Daryl need? What's up? What, do I gotta, what problem do I got to solve now? And I turned to him. And he looked at me and didn't say a word. He just pointed up. And I stopped and I looked up. And for the first time in my life, I saw 
what a night sky looks like when there's no ground light and no clouds and no moon. Guys, there are like a bazillion stars up there, all right? There are so many stars, there's almost not any places where there aren't stars. There's like almost no black. It's just an ocean of stars, overwhelmingly intense. I looked up and my jaw dropped and Daryl and I stood there in awe. And suddenly the whole mission strip changed as we realized it's that God who's come down here And that's our message, that he has a gift to give. I'll never forget the moment. Daryl and I still talk about it to this day. God wants to have that kind of a moment with every person on the planet. Everybody you work with, everybody you live with, everybody in your family, everybody in your school. He wants to have that kind of a moment with them. That's what he's doing with this moment. He says, I've got a gift to give you. And it is infinitely greater than you can imagine. The first part of the gift is to untangle your thinking about who God is. And the second part is to hear his invitation to join him. So Jesus makes this offer and watch how the woman responds. Look at verse 11. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where will you get this living water? See, what she's thinking is that what she needs is something earthly. And that's all she can see and that's all she can think about. Most people are like that. Many of us sitting here this morning are are falling into that trap. All we can think about is what our earthly needs are, forgetting that we are infinitely more than a body and a mind, that we are souls and that eternity is just around the corner. This woman is in that mode. All she can think about is her earthly needs. She says, how are you going to get me some water? She says, verse 12, are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself as did his sons and his flocks and his herd? Now, the irony is that the short answer is, yep. (laughs) Because the God of Jacob has become a human being and is standing in front of you right now. You know, a lot of times we assume that if God were standing in front of us, we would know it. But the Bible tells us that most of the time, most people didn't. They didn't recognize that. Because they were so preoccupied, so distracted with other things. This woman doesn't. She says, are you greater? Yeah. In a moment, Jesus is going to say, so much greater you can't even imagine. But he answers her first. Look at verses 13 and 14. He says, you know, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst again. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. In other words, I'm going to give you something you need more than water. I'm offering you something you need more than water. Gang, let's take a moment and think about this. Remember the folks who who had those uh, fish and bread multiplied by Jesus, 5,000 fed in a single day on one occasion, 3,000 on another occasion. You know what? They all got hungry again. They all needed another dinner, another breakfast, another lunch, the next day, the same day. Do you remember when Jesus turned the water into wine at the wedding in Cana and Galilee? Guess what? The jars ran out. The wine went out. It had to be replaced. Remember when he calmed the storms on the sea? Several occasions he actually did that. Guess what? Those storms happened again. They're still happening to this day. Remember when that man owed the temple tax, didn't have money to pay it, and Jesus told him to go look in the mouth of a fish. He found money to pay it. Guess what? Next month, the tax came due again. It did. Evidently, some demoniacs that were possessed, Jesus says later got repossessed, which gives new meaning to that word. Yeah, some did. The fishermen who caught a record call, a haul of fish because of Jesus' power, guess what? They ran out. He had to go fishing again. Remember every person Jesus miraculously healed? They went on. They got old. They got sick. They died again. Remember the people he raised from the grave? Every one of them went on, got old, and died again. You know why? Because we need something more. All those things are real. We celebrate miracles. They happen. We believe in them. We even seek them in Jesus' name. But what we need is something more. And Jesus knows that. 
We need more than a miracle. We resist the idea, clinging white-knuckled to some fantasy of a short-term earthly cure for our eternal ills. The woman does that. Look at verse 15. She said to him, sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. All she can think about is the horizontal. Even though he's repeatedly talking to her about something greater, she just keeps focusing on the little things. And so then Jesus does something that most of us aren't brave enough and don't love enough to do. He reaches deep into her, deep into her personal stuff, because he knows that our real problems are in our souls, they're in our hearts, they're in our minds, they're on the inside of us. Look at what he does, verses 16 to 18. He told her, go call your husband and come back. I remember as a young believer reading this story and hearing her response and thinking, Jesus, you just jumped right in the middle of her stuff. That kind of seems rude. It seems confrontational and, and unwelcome. And why would you out her like that? Well, you know what the answer is? Because he loves her. Because he loves her. And friends, in the very same way, it is Jesus' love for you and me that causes him to reach right into our sins. Right into yours, right into mine. And he wants to reach right into the sins of every person on the planet because he knows that's where the real healing is. He says, go call your husband. She says, I have no husband. He already knows that. Jesus said to her, you're right. When you say you have no husband, the fact is you've had five and the man you're with now is not your husband. Please understand, friends, Jesus isn't condemning her. He knows that she's been on a lifelong quest of what the eagles called looking for love in all the wrong places. And she's not finding it. And so over and over and over again, she chases the next man like some men chase the next woman like some people chase the next thrill. And every one of them falls short. Every one of them is not enough. He reaches into her endless, hopeless, helpless search for life and joy and meaning and satisfaction. And he says, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. You see, friends, here's what we must understand. God loves so much that he reaches into my sins, that he seeks to reach into yours. Have you let him go there? It's when you let him go there that you discover the gift that he's offering. A Lutheran pastor who I deeply admire has written this, living water, because it is grace personified, flows down into the deepest part of who we are down to the root of things, down to our dark places, because that's where grace goes to bring healing. It goes down into those places. Most people in this world will not go this deep with you. It's too hard. It's too much of a hassle. It's uncomfortable. And besides, they have problems of their own. And, you know, the other side of it is even if they were inclined to go there, they don't have a clue to help you because they're not God. You will never find what your soul needs in another human being. But Jesus is offering her what can only come from God. And, and here's what I want us to grasp. You feel his heart for her? He loves her. He's not up there going, you know what? You got all these issues. Once you get your act together, come see me and we'll help you. He says, no, I'm going to meet you right where you are. And I'm going to meet you with a gift. It's a free gift. I want to give it to you now. I know you're struggling over and over and over again, you've chased this will-o'-wisp of satisfaction and romance. It hasn't worked, but right here, right now, I want to give you what you're really craving, and it's free. Gang, that's our message. <laughs> that's the Christmas gospel. We're not saying to the world, shape up or ship out. That's not the Christian message. The message is, God says, I have a gift for you. It, it means touching your sin, but it will become in you everything you've ever needed. When it comes to God, like most people, this woman has been sucked into a quicksand of religious nonsense, like the stuff that clutters up the internet and fills up YouTube and TikTok and Vivo and Instagram and all the rest, and even many churches. 
Sir, the woman says, I can see that you are a prophet. There's so many people willing to call Jesus a prophet, but not willing to receive him for who he is. The Son of God, God the Son, the Word become flesh, God seeking me, God seeking you. She says, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. She goes all religious on him. She zeroes in on what we're doing instead of what God's doing, on how we climb up to God instead of the fact that God has climbed down to us and that he's meeting her in this moment. And so Jesus says, I who speak to you am he. God has come to meet you right here and right now. That's the Christmas gospel for everybody that we consider enemies, for everybody that we consider friends, for you, for me. That's the gospel. God has a free gift to give. Can you feel his heart, his desire to give it? That's what this story is all about. He's saying to her, I'm here for you now. He's saying it to you and me. I'm here for you now. And through us, he wants to say it to the whole world. I'm here for you now. In the middle of your mess. Now, we're almost done. This is the home stretch. It's a beautiful moment. But this morning, we want to take one more step forward. Because this story in John 4 finishes with Jesus talking about what just happened with the woman in this story. The scripture says, if you read the rest of the story, that the woman was amazed, was blown away. She believed in him. She went into town. She told everybody she knew and brought them out to Jesus. And by the end of the day, a whole bunch of people have come to him, have received him as their savior, have become his followers, have been born again. And all that happens as the result of her telling her story of meeting him. This is where we circle back to where we began, gang. God doesn't need you to have all the answers or to be right about everything or to have your entire household in order in order to be part of his mission. He just wants you to tell the stories of your experiences with Jesus and to share them with people you meet when the moment comes. Just being yourself and talking about those realities. Jesus uses that kind of moment to reach a host of people in this village. And then he ends it with a little lesson for the disciples and for us. Verses 35 to 38, Jesus says, open your eyes, he says to his disciples, and look at the fields. They're ripe for harvest. Even now the reaper draws his wages. Even now he harvests the crop for eternal life. He's using word pictures to talk about people are coming to God. People are getting connected with God as Father. And then he says this, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. What does he mean? He means that this woman's coming to faith is not a thing that happened just in this moment. It's been going on over her lifetime. There's a team of people who've been playing a part in this moment. He says, thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. Same thing Paul was saying in 1 Corinthians 3. I sent you to reap what you haven't worked for. And then he says this, others have done the hard work and you've reaped the benefits of their labor. In other words, guys, this business of people getting connected to God isn't just about someone in a moment having a, a harvest moment with a person. It's about a lifetime of moments. Just like all the people that played a part in your life and in my life. When I think about this, my mind goes back to a, a young man, a fellow Marine, when I was stationed in Iceland in 1982, and we were sent to clean a field day ahead, which means clean the bathroom. And we're in there doing this all morning, and it's a big job, and I'm playing my music, and it's loud, and it's rowdy, and it's raunchy, and about halfway through the morning, he says, hey, can I put in one of my tapes, cassette tapes, they were these little things that had music on them back in the day. He says, hey, can I put one of my tapes in? I said, yeah. So, so he, as long as it's not country music, I said, I was joking. And he put his tape in, and it wasn't. It was good old rock and roll. But it was different. Because these guys were singing like in King James Shakespearean English, and they were talking about God and the Spirit and salvation. But they were rocking. <laughs> and I thought, wow, this is different. This is weird. What is this? And after his cassette tape played, he noticed that I seemed to like it. And so he just said the simplest thing to me. He said, hey, do you like that? I said, yeah. He says, here, it's yours. Oh, dude, you can't give me your cassette. Yeah, here, take it, it's yours. I only know his last name, Wenham. But what he did 
was incredibly significant because I was the kind of guy who would take the cassette tape back and read all the liner notes and try and figure out what the songs were about. And oh my goodness, it's Jesus and God and Bible and Holy Spirit. What the heck is this? What does this mean? And so he became part of the team that brought me to the Lord. That's what God is seeking with you and me. Just those little moments, plant a seed, water a seed. Have a conversation at lunchtime with a lady about gift that God wants to give her. Share your own story of what Jesus has done in your life. And God was inviting the disciples in that moment to become part of his team. And this morning, as we finish, God's inviting us to do the same thing. I said we're going to do something very different this morning. Here it comes. When you came in today, there was a little uh, blueprint handout on your chair. The time has come. Our board of deacons uh, has decided that the time has come to really step out and build this children's expansion next year. Our development team has done an enormous amount of work, and, and that work has brought us to the point where next year we anticipate actually building this thing right next door, a children's expansion for our kids. Now, when I think about that, I think about all the moments that add up to someone becoming a believer. And the reality is that everything we're experiencing now is because we stand on the shoulders of people who've gone before us, of people who've been faithful before us, of people who have carried the mission before us. In the last 10 years, we've baptized almost 300 people here at Mount Rainier Christian Center who've made a confession of faith. But it wasn't about what we did. It was about all the teams in their lives playing parts. And you and I at MRCC in 2021, we stand on a bunch of shoulders. Let me share with you real quick. This is a picture of the church when it was founded. And on the left, here in Amplot, on the left, this is from 1932. You'll see the names of the people who felt that God had called them to plant a church. <laughs> this is the, what we call the Articles of Incorporation when the church became a church in the Assemblies of God. We stand on their shoulders because of what they did we are here. They were the sowers. <laughs> In some ways, we are the reapers. How many Sunday school classes? How many coffee socials? How many ladies meetings? How many sermons? How many worship services? How many missions efforts were these people involved with? And as the years went by, other people were faithful as well. Matter of fact, this is a list of some of the, the pastors of our church here. I wish I had pictures of everybody. But uh, And by the way, if you want to look at this in depth, it's posted on the wall out here in the hallway going towards the children's area. But these are some of the, the faithful people on whose shoulders we stand. Go ahead and slide through those. Made it awesome. uh, the building downtown, you may recognize that across from Weeks Funeral Home for a season. That was Enum Claw Assembly. Uh, and then you go on Dan Mazur, Byron Diddy. The Diddy family is still uh, very much a part of MRCC. Harold Smith, uh, when this building was built, which is the kids' area down there, the kids' area used to be the sanctuary, imagine. Um, and then it goes on. Eldon Kirschman, John Shane. John Shane, now a missionary among orphans in Russia. Brent and Jesse Kimball, who led the church when it built this sanctuary building. And then at the end, a couple of goofballs who didn't think to dress up. I'm forever embarrassed that we're in our biking clothes there, but there it is, you know. We stand on all those shoulders, and now we have a chance to be the shoulders for the next generation. So here's what that looks like. We're going to build this building next year. God has invited us to give towards building that building. We're not going to do it right here and right now. Somebody said to me, okay, we've got a plan. The development team's put all this work together. It's taken years. We've talked to the city, blah, blah, blah. Now we've got to hire somebody to come in and raise money. What a pile up nothing. We're not doing that, okay? There's going to be no thermometer on the wall. There's going to be no card I hand you to give money. Instead, here's what the Bible says about these moments when we come to give. The Bible says, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, each one should give what he's decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion because God loves a cheerful giver. And when we give ourselves to this mission, like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, we are rewarded. We get to be part of the team that helps other people become believers. So here's the simple thing I'm asking. It's the first time I've done this in 15 years as our pastor. What would you feel led to give towards building that children's building? Not right here, not right now, but over the next few months as we step out into the new year, what would God call you to give to help make that children's building a reality? And whatever that is, that's between you and the Lord. But as we move into the new year, you have opportunities to express that 
And we'll go forward being part of the team that reaches people. I want to finish with a story uh, this morning. And it goes back to my Bible college days. When I was at Northwest University, the the chair of the New Testament department was a guy named Dr. Francis Tay. Dr. Tay was brilliant. He was also the most boring, dry, low-key. Nobody wanted to take his classes. It was hard to stay awake. You you had to drag yourself in there. He knew everything. (laughs) but he was just so dry and boring. Well, every day uh, in those days, we had a chapel service in the morning and all the students would gather for worship and for preaching Monday through Friday. And, um, you know, with that happening a lot, you know, the bar for speakers was pretty high. One Tuesday morning, I remember heading towards the chapel and the reader board said that Dr. Tay was going to be preaching that morning. We all looked at each other and said, I'm just going to go jump off a bridge. I'm not going to survive this. This is going to be awful. It's going to be horrible. Listen to Dr. Tay in chapel. Are you kidding? The driest, dullest person I can possibly imagine. And some guys just bailed. <laughs> some of us said, ah, oh, we got to be faithful. And we dragged ourselves in there. And I remember thinking, this is a bad idea. <laughs> we worshiped together. Dr. Tay got up to speak and He chose as his passage 1 Kings chapter 4, verses 8 to 11, which wasn't promising. Let me share 1 Kings chapter 4, verses 8 to 11. Here's what it says. These are their names. Ben-Hur in the hill country of Ephraim. Not this Ben-Hur, a different (laughs) Ben-Hur. Ben-Decker in Makaz. Sha'albim, Beth Shemesh. And Ellen Bethanan, not this Ellen, a different Ellen. <laughs> ben Hazed in Aruboth, and Ben Abinadab in Napath Dor. Close your Bible, bless the Lord, praise God. That was the passage. And we're all going, are you kidding? And then Dr. Tay launched into the most amazing message I heard in my entire time at Bible College. Because you know what it was about? Those are just names to us but they're not to him. Every single one of them is precious to him, so precious that he's recorded their names for eternity. They were part of what God was doing in the world. They were God's fellow workers, and as a consequence, he remembers them all by name, and he bores us to death with long lists of their names because they're so precious to him. You know, none of those people who signed that document in 1932 to found our church thought that we'd be looking at their names in 2021. But God knows every one of them by name because they're his fellow workers. They're part of his team of bringing other people. And this is one more chance to do that. So let me invite you to pray, to seek God in your own heart. Say, God, what would you have me give towards building that children's building? so that we can serve our kids, so that we can be part of the team of other people becoming believers. Really simple. No fundraising, no thermometer, no cards. Just you and God. Cheerfully, not under compulsion. What would you choose to give towards what God is doing? Let's think about that as we head into next year. Would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes? God, we thank you for calling us your fellow workers. We thank you for the opportunity of being part of what you're doing in in lots of ways and in this way, in this giving way. God, we stand on the shoulders of people who have built your church over the decades, over a century. God, now we get to be part of that for the next generation. Show us the part you would have us play, each one of us, as we get ready to build that building next year. May you be glorified. God, long after we're gone, kids will be ministered to in that building. Teach us how to be part of that, we pray. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? I went long in first service, and so yell at me about the parking lot, but now I just did it again. So um, apologize to third service as they come in, would you? Now may the love of God the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit go with you throughout this week. Go with God. Tell someone you love them. Have a great afternoon. Given in the giving, joining us with heaven. I wanna see it now. I wanna hear the sound. Kingdom is come.
the light dawning in the darkness reaching to the farthest shining in the shadows there is a child